Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our glory, blessings, and honor to you. Thank you for this time where we get to study your word. We pray, Father, that uh, you help us to grow a deeper understanding of you for your glory and for our joy. In your name we pray. Amen. The Bible is the most popular book that we have in the history of humanity. Jesus has been on the most cover of magazines. Jesus has been the most painted figure in all of human history. Jesus is the most popular person that has ever existed. Many argue that the book of Romans, which we're going to be studying from, is probably the most important book that's ever been written outside of the Bible and within the Bible. The book of Romans has caused lots of changes in people. Um, from Augustine, many of the church fathers, the Protestant Reformation began because of the book of Romans. So today, as we talk about the sovereignty of God, we're going to be talking about and reading from the book of Romans. I give you a handout. That handout is Romans chapter 8, arguably the most important chapter in the book of Romans. And so uh, you, in that, you can you know, write notes on it for Romans chapter 8. So Jesus is the most popular because as we know in the Christian faith, he lived and died for us. Jesus was very special. He was born of a virgin. He water skied without a ski. He fed 5,000 with a Lunchable. He cleansed people from being demon-possessed. And it's because of his perfect life, his perfect death, and his resurrection, we worship him. And so, right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is still serving us, even to this day. And we'll see that in the book of Romans. And so, in Romans chapter 1, we're going to see that Paul calls himself a servant. And our goal today, at the end of this retreat, is to be able to say that we're servants also. That we respond to his calling for us. Paul, as you know, was a religious zealot. Before he preached about Jesus, he preached about jihad. He was a religious terrorist. He was the godfather of finding Christians and finding them and persecuting them. And as you know, in the book of Acts, he was there and he carried the coats for those who stoned Stephen. And so before Paul became the juggernaut that he is, Paul writes at least half of the New Testament. He is someone who is religious, but is not someone who knows Jesus. And so then enters Jesus, right? And that's what happens to all of us, right? We have our own lifestyles. We have our own belief systems. And then Jesus enters, and then we become a changed person. And arguably, this is the greatest conversion story that's ever affected the world. So, and for many of us, this is our story. Jesus comes into our life and we become changed people. When I was in college, um, I was very prideful. I graduated early from high school. I got into a program where you could skip your last two years of high school. Um, and I went into that program with lots of enthusiasm and um, I was you know, my greatest fan. I love to play basketball, and I love to study. And quickly did I learn that I wasn't so smart. Uh, basketball and peer pressure quickly became more important in my life. And uh, I, uh, in my first semester, went on scholastic probation. As you know, probation is never good in any form. Um, and that was my first great awakening. At the end of that semester, my second semester, because I was on probation, if I didn't get a good enough GPA, I was going to get kicked out of that program. And I would have to go back to high school, back to the grade I originally left from. At the end of my second semester, one of my friends or acquaintances committed suicide. And two of them died in a tragic boating accident. And it's at that point in my life I saw the reality of humanity, the reality of death. And what kept ringing in my head was, Eternity. Eternity. 
as I go to their funerals, what's ringing in my head is eternity. And so as we study the book of Romans, as we see the sovereignty of God, as we sing one thing remains, let's keep on remembering and reminding ourselves that God is sovereign. And that is the one thing that remains. And so if you look with me in Romans chapter 1, um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And we're going to see the heart of Paul. Uh, Paul has a lot of theology, but the, at the end of the day, he's a missionary. Missionaries are about practicality and getting the job done. And so we'll get into his theology, but you also need to see his heart. And this is what we need to know when we serve Christ, that it's not about convenience. And this is why I applaud Achin and the Youth Fellowship to have this one-day retreat, because it's really inconvenient and it's risky to do something like this now, right? But to God be glorified. Because we can talk about human suffering, but what we're trying to do is to prevent the greatest suffering, an eternity of suffering. We can talk about maybe one of us getting sick with COVID, and that's a risk. We all understand that. But the greater risk is the eternity of not knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord. It's like when you come in through the emergency room, who do you take first? Do you take the heart attack or do you take the person with the cold? You take the heart attack. You have to triage. You have to make a decision on what you want to do. And so again, I applaud Uchin. I applaud the fellowship to come to the realization that our eternity is at stake. The members of this church, the youth fellowship, we consider y'all priceless. All of life is sacred, born and preborn. And so we have to understand that eternity is at stake. In our world today, there's lots of intellect, but no wisdom. This is why some of the smartest people do the dumbest things. We know how to make an atom bomb. That's intellect. But do we know when to use it? That's wisdom. We know how to end life, but we, do we know how important or how sacred life is? And so, in the book of Romans, we're going to learn about predestination, election, um, and this is where we see basically Jesus votes, and he, he is the voter. And as you can see with our current society, voting and putting in human hands is not good. What a mess everything is now. So this is why we trust in God, because he is the one true and right judge, he is the one true and right king, and he is our sovereign. And in the book of Romans, you're going to find that you're a sinner. If your mom said you're perfect, Paul would consider her a heretic. The book of Romans says that everyone is a sinner. In the book of Romans, it says that there are two sexes, male and female. In the book of Romans, it says that marriage is just between a man and a woman in the bounds of marriage. If you tweet that, your account's going to get deleted. Put that on your Facebook account, you're going to get dislikes. It is becoming more costly to be a Christian in America. It's becoming more expensive to be a Christian in America. And we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. And so as we study the book of Romans, my, my prayer is for myself and for all of us to grow this deeper understanding of the sovereignty of God. Because like we sang, I'm going to say it again over and over, one thing remains, and that's him and him alone. And in his hands, nothing can happen to us without his control. In Romans chapter 1, the theme verse, Romans 1 verse 16 to 17 it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the theme verse of the book of Romans. He's going to go through all this theology and all this practical nature for living as a Christian. And this is considered the theme verse. At the end of the day, we have to be able to say, 
I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is the good news. Whatever happens in my life, this is the good news. And then we're going to see later in the book of Romans that we become estranged from God. God sees us as a broken people, as a people who, from the book of Genesis, became fallen. And if you look at uh, Romans chapter 2, it should be on the next slide, um, we make mistakes. And in these mistakes, we have the right to be judged by God. Uh, in society today, we are very uh, argumentative. We can barely talk to others who have a different opinion from us without becoming judgmental. And in the book of Romans chapter 2, it says, who are you to judge? Right? You see something on Facebook you disagree with, you might put a thumbs down, you might not say anything. Or if you see it on Twitter, you might dislike it and you disagree. But this judgment that we all have is for all of us in the book of Romans. We all are very judgmental people, and we see it so clearly now with social media because all of our feelings are out there. We can see what we agree with, what we disagree with. We're judging something. And Paul is saying, who are you to judge? And Paul is trying to create a sense of empathy here. Paul is like a coach and not a critic. The, you know what the difference between a coach and a critic is? Let's say I'm playing basketball and I take the last shot the, and I miss. The critic's going to say, you missed the shot. You're no good. The coaches saw same, the same thing. But the coach is going to come from the vantage point of empathy to make you better. But they both saw the same thing. As we go through the book of Romans, Paul is going to coach us and say, yes, we've all made mistakes. Yes, we're all sinners. He even says it himself. But he is going to coach us into seeing the sovereignty of God. He's going to coach us into succeeding. And what ultimately we'll see in the book of Romans is how the cross shows how bad we are and how good Jesus is. And it says in Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of humanity. Because we've all judged and we've all considered ourselves to be judged. And so we'll see that in Romans chapter 3. And so Romans is about the human judgment of, the human condition of judgment of justice and righteousness. And God is the only one perfect of doing so. If you don't believe in God, then you believe only government can do this. Only government can do judgment, justice, and righteousness. Then the question is, what type of government is that? And so this is why we hold fast to the living God, because he is the only just judge. He is the only one who is righteous. And so... For this next portion, what I want to do is basically we're going to do a little study on Romans chapter 8. I give you your handout, and if you have your Bibles, you can use your Bible. But I want to do a verse-by-verse -verse look at the book of Romans uh, chapter 8. So this is to be conversational. I want us to get into it like it's actual Bible study and less of a monologue. And so... We're going to be talking about what we see in the scripture and what it means. And so in Romans um, chapter 7, verse 22, right before we get to chapter 8, this is what he says. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but my flesh I serve the law of sin. So here we see that Paul is even battling. He has difficulty being this perfect Christian. St. Paul, the guy who writes 13, if not 14 books of the New Testament, saying that he struggles with this. If he struggles with this, how can we not? 
And then we get to verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're going to memorize a Bible verse, this is one of them. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When someone says you're going to go to hell for what you did, this is the verse you need to have going on in your mind. When you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about that because you are in Christ. So then the question is, what does in Christ mean? Right? If there's no condemnation, if he's struggling with sin, we see in chapter 7, verse 25, and there's no condemnation, this must be really important. Right? I've done bad things in my life. We all have stuff in the closet that is bad. But how is it that God forgives me? Therefore now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do you get to in Christ Jesus? Not everyone is in Christ Jesus, but there is a union in Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, chapters, uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, by, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. When we become baptized, we are into Christ. And we'll get into, your first question is, but I was baptized as a baby. We're going to get into that. Next slide, Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. This is the most basic experience of being buried with Jesus Christ in faith. And so once we become baptized and we have this faith in him, we are in Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is our union with Christ. We live by faith. One of the greatest analogies for our baptism is the Israelite tradition of circumcision. Did all of those who became circumcised be part of the covenant of Abraham? No, they had to have faith. So just like that, as children, we become baptized, and then we develop our faith, and God gives us that. So how is God related to faith? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. The faith you have is even a gift of God. So we've been baptized into Christ. We have our faith. And even the faith we have is a gift from God. Then we see verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That is the gospel in a nutshell, right there, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus came just like us. God came and became man and incarnate, and that's what we celebrate in Christmas, and he became flesh, and in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh. This is the heart of the Christian gospel. This is what we call the substitution is he's going to be taking our punishment as he becomes human. And then we see in verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so here, when we see in verse 4, the righteous requirement of the law, 
What is the righteous requirement of the law? It's love. And Jesus is the only one who fulfills that perfectly. And so, in order that the righteous fulfillment of the law might be filled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we're supposed to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. We're not supposed to walk according to the law. The law is like an x-ray machine. If I have a pneumonia and I get an x-ray, that x-ray will be able to tell me I have a pneumonia. But can that x-ray take rid of the pneumonia? Can it take care of the infection? No. It can only diagnose it. And that's what the law does. And it does it perfectly. And it won every time. The law, every time it, you put it up next to a person, guilty, guilty, guilty. But there was one person that they could not find guilty, and that was Jesus Christ. And so he fulfills the righteousness of the law. He was the only one who did that perfectly. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, we see that love is a fruit of the Spirit, and these are the righteousness of the law. And then we see verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If you remember <clears throat> when um, in, in the book of Matthew, uh, Peter was resisting Jesus um, to be hurt, and um, Jesus says to Peter, Satan, get behind me. Right. This is what we see of him setting his mind on the flesh. Peter had his own idea of what the things were going to be, but Jesus has his mind on the spirit, not on the flesh. And so the life of the spirit is sustained and its origin comes from the glory of God. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for if it does not submit to God's law, Indeed, it cannot. What's the difference between may not and cannot? Right now, my kids are 8, 7, and 4, and we're trying to tell them the difference between may not and cannot. Daddy, can I get a drink of water? Yeah, you can, but you may not right now. It's midnight. Go back to bed. What's the difference between can and may? Here we see Paul is using cannot. Cannot, can, is ability. And what he says here is, and, and may is permission. May I have a glass of water? Yes, you may. Can I have a glass of water? Yes, you can. It's your ability. Here we see in verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It cannot. It is not able to. And then he keeps on going, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So then the next question is, how do we please God? If everything I do is by the law, how am I ever going to be good enough? Verse 9. Verse 8 is devastating, this piece of scripture, because you cannot be good enough in and of yourself. Then we get to verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. You belong to somebody. Somebody owns you. You know when you're on the basketball court and someone's doing an excellent job and just tearing you up? Like, I own you, bro. Someone owns you. You actually belong to somebody. When you're thinking, should I do this or that? You should also be thinking, not just what your parents are going to think, but what God thinks. Why? You belong to him. Everything that you do, you belong to him. You submit it to him. He bought you with Price. 
And that's a seal, right? That's a mark. Bought you. Many people have been converted from this verse when they found out that they actually belong to somebody. Some people just don't feel like they belong. They feel like an outcast. They just don't feel like they're part of any group. But you know what? When you're in Christ, you belong to God. No matter what anybody says. Verse 10, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. In verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so there's three effects when the spirit is in us. There's three effects that happen of the spirit uh, in us. It's in verse 9 and verse 10. I want you all to start talking now. What effects do you all see when the spirit is in you? Look at verse 9 and verse 10. Yeah, there's victory over the flesh. When you're in the Spirit, you're actually a victor now. When you're in Christ, you're a victor. That's one consequence of being in the Spirit. What's the next one? I, we, I just discussed that one. You belong to Christ. You are owned by somebody else. So you're a victor. You belong to somebody. And look at verse 11. what we're all waiting for one day, the last part. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. When the spirit is in you, the third thing that happens is your mortal bodies would be raised. This is a promise of scripture. This is the promise of God. This is the power of God that he would take a fallen, sinful creature, humanity, and he's going to raise us. So then, he goes in verse 12, so then, with that information, right, we're in Christ, right, um, he's, the, the, he's, re he's fulfilled the righteous law, Jesus. The law can't save us. The Spirit is what saves us. Our bodies cannot please God. Not that it may not, it, it cannot please God. And you are bought with a price. You belong to him. You are victors because you are in Christ. So then, so then what? what? What do we do because of that? Verse 12. We, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh. So a debtor, you owe somebody something, right? When you're in debt. We're not debtors to the flesh. We don't have to, oh, I've got to go do this and that. I've got to do Sunday school. I've got to uh, be nice to my parents. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. That's the law. You don't do those things to get you into heaven, right? You do those things because of God's gracious. We're not debtors to the flesh. When you live life in the Spirit, you have the fruits of the Spirit. There's love, joy, peace. And so, brothers, are we debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do we put to death the, the deeds of the body? One of the hardest things. We all have a sin we struggle with. How do you put that sin to death? How do you kill it? I can only imagine the struggles y'all are going through now. In my day, 
it was bad, but I can only imagine how much worse it is because y'all have access to so much. I actually don't envy being y'all. I don't know if I could be y'all. That's how tough I think it is for y'all. Praise God that there's a church that preaches the truth. I don't think you're going to hear it anywhere else. How do you put death the deeds of the body so that you will live? You put on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The sword of the Spirit. The sword is the word of God. The question is, is how do you wield the sword, right? Everything else is defense. The only offense we have is what? The word of God. You've got to carry your Bible. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to study your Bible. Can you give me an example in the Bible where someone wielded the word of God and destroyed a, a sin, destroyed death? Remember when Jesus was being tempted in the desert? What did he do every time Satan came up to him? He quoted scripture. The word of God, the sword of God. If we do not know scripture, we're not going to be able to put the deeds of death down. We're not going to be able to kill. You need to have songs in your head, maybe what the worship team sings that are truthful. You need to have the scriptures in your mind when you struggle with something. How do you conquer those things? It has to be with the sword. It has to be with the word of God. That's when you live by the spirit, right? Oh, I'm looking at stuff on the internet I shouldn't look at. What I got to do is probably just avoid getting on the internet at that time and go to sleep earlier. That's not living by the spirit. That's living by the flesh. You're just making more rules for yourself. But the word of God can conquer that sword of the spirit can conquer that. We all have different sins we struggle with. You need to be able to conquer your sins and the way you do that is by the word of God, by wielding it. You don't go to war without a weapon. You don't go to spiritual war the same way. Study your scripture, read the Bible, know it. Believe it. Verses eight, uh, chapter eight, twelve through seventeen. The children of God. Verse thirteen. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse fourteen. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. I know the ladies don't like to be called sons of God, but I don't like to be called a bride of Christ. Right? So we're equal. Can't see myself wearing a wedding dress. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. the spirit of adoption. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. As sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Adoption. Are any of you adopted? All of us should raise our hands, right? <laughs> if we're in Christ, we're adopted. One of the greatest things you could do as a parent is to adopt a child. Because that's how God did for us. Children are just waiting in orphanages. 
unloved, not taken care of. Yet, mom and the dad come. They're like, we'll take him. We'll take her. Worthy of love? It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of time and effort. But that's what God did for us. We haven't been given the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. When you don't have a father, you fall into fear. And you can even see this in society. What do you do when you don't have dad? You compensate. You have to take care of everybody now. There's no dad. So you got to get prideful. You've got to set boundaries. You've got to overcome the hurdles of this world. Verse 15, I just did. Fatherlessness causes fear, but nobody wants to be scared, so we become bullies to compensate. That's what I wanted to say. When you don't have a father, nobody wants to be scared, and so what you do is you become a bully to compensate. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. So not only are we adopted, but we're heirs. The heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified. When you receive the Spirit, he works with you to cry, Abba, Father. What does it mean to suffer with him? It says there in verse 17, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him. In 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says it like this, that this is a light and momentary affliction. When Paul's writing this, the Christian church is being persecuted. And he's saying this is momentary and this is light, this affliction that you're having. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. There is a great destiny ahead of us. Right? We know what's happening because we have the book of Revelation. There's a great destiny ahead of us. And there's nothing to compare to that glory than what we're going to go through now or in the future for us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was sub subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21, that the creation itself will, set, will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so God set it up so that creation itself will be set free. And creation itself will glorify him. Did creation do it willingly to become subjected? No, not willingly, it says. It's because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the birth pangs of childbirth until now. I used to read that as a bad thing. But after you have a kid, or three, you realize birth pangs ain't so bad, because that means your baby's coming. You're excited. And so we see here 
we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in birth pains. It doesn't mean there's no pain. There's pain with it. But it's also an exciting time. The baby's about to come. What you've been praying for, what you've been hoping for, come. And here we see something's about to happen. Something's about to be born. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly. As we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so here we see in uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 6, I think there's a slide on that. Um, for the nation will rise against nation and the kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, but there will be famines. And these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Something's happening. Creation's moving towards something. And this is the beginning of something happening. And Paul repeats that here in the book of Romans. And we also will become, we also will groan. In verse 23, and not only in creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so we groan inwardly also. We say, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We want him to come. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is not seen is not hope, for the hope of what we for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. He's telling us that as we go through these birth pains, as we groan, we need to do this with patience. In the midst of persecution, in the midst of the difficult life you have, endure, be patient. Because again, you can't compare the present sufferings with the glory that's going to come in the future. In verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How do we groan, you ask? Verse 26, likewise the spirits help us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He wants us to know that we can endure and be patient. Know that the Spirit will intercede for us. When God the Father searches our hearts, our hearts are doing the groaning, but the Holy Spirit is what stirs them up. Paul wrote most of his letters while he was in prison. And I think if I was in prison, I would be praying for deliverance. Prison. But if Paul was delivered so quickly, we wouldn't have most of our letters in the Bible. I bet Paul was praying for endurance. He was in prison. And not deliverance. As you go through suffering in this life, you should ask yourself, why are you suffering? Maybe it's for the glory of God. Should you be really praying for deliverance? Or maybe you should be praying for patience or endurance because it makes you more like him. What if the purpose of marriage was not to make you happy but holy? What if the purpose of everything we go through in life is to make us holy and not happy? That reorients everything. God the Father hears the prayers of God the Spirit and on the basis of the finished work of God the Son. Here we see the actual Trinity involved as we pray. The Spirit's yearning within us and prays towards the will of the God, the Father, and we do this because of the finished work of Christ. Jesus seated at the right hand of God is still serving us today. Even as we pray.
verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. This is the ace of spades. This is one to memorize. Y'all play spades? Anybody play spades? Nobody play spades? What do y'all play? Card games, not card games? So there's a game called spades, and the best card to have is the ace of spades. It, it trumps everything. So this verse trumps lots of things, just about everything. When you're going through something tough in life, Romans 8.20. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He says we know. Because in the few verses prior, he says we don't know how to pray. And now he's saying, but here's what we do know. What we do know is that God's working all things for good. We can have confidence in that. We can't have confidence in myself and praying so the Spirit intercedes. But what I can be confident in is that all things will work for God's glory, for his goodness. What is good? Actually, let's, let's rephrase that. What is all things, right? All things. What are you talking about? This is Paul. He was beaten. He was bit by a snake. I think he was beaten 40 minus 1. At 40, you're supposed to be dead. And that was five times. If anyone's going to ask the question of all things God works for good, it should be Paul. Walking 20 miles a day. and Preaching the word of God. Getting in prison. Yet God works all things for good. What are all things? Romans 11.36, do I have that slide up? From, from him and through him and to him are all things. Everything. All things is all things. Ephesians 1.11-12, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works what? All things according to the counsel of his will. Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that has been revealed to us. Bad things, good things, and everything in between. All things. That's a sovereign God. If your God is not sovereign, then that is not God. That's something else you can heard. Heard. So, what is all things? Is everything. Next question is, is what is good? He works all things for good. Does that mean I get a nice Cadillac? Two-story house? Big screen TVs? He works everything for good, right? What is good? Look at verse 29 and 30. Tell me what is good. What do y'all think? What is good? 29 and 30. Three things. What is considered good? Throw something. Right after that is the first thing. Conform to the image of his son. What is good is when we start looking like Jesus, when we're conformed, looking like him. How do you define what is good, what is bad? Here you go. If it looks like Jesus.
That's the first thing. We're conformed to the image of his son. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. What is that good being conformed to the image of his son? What else? Yep. Jesus will be preeminent. What's good? When Jesus is number one. Not number two. Not number 1.1. Jesus is number one. That's good. According to Paul. And the third thing. That's in verse 30. Our glorification. Thank God. We're part of that. Our glorification. Verse 30, And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What is this call? What is the call of God? Those he called, he justified. Everyone who is called is justified. So those who are called are justified, and we know that from Romans 3.28, because we have been justified having faith. So the call is more than just a hearing. It actually creates faith. When God calls you, he's not just saying, hey, what's up? When God calls, he creates. He creates something from nothing. Just like he created the universe. He created something from nothing. When God calls you, he creates that faith in you. Because who he calls, he justifies. It's not who he calls and then maybe justifies, because we don't know how they're going to turn out. It's who he calls, he justifies. So when God speaks, he creates. The call creates life. It's like Lazarus. He said, get up. He got up. God calls. You're justified. Whom those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then back in verse 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of God. In the next slide, we should see 1 Corinthians 8, I believe. If anyone loves God, he has been known by God. The foreknow. In Genesis, we see that Adam knew Eve her, he knew her. And then in Genesis 18, we also see that whom he chooses, he knows. If God doesn't call us, then we would be dead in our sins. And this is why salvation is a gift. This is why eternity in heaven is a gift. Because who he calls, he justifies. He made it right with God. How did he make it right with God? By the cross. And this is why salvation is a gift. God foreknew sinful people. God predestined sinful people. And God foreordained the slaying of his son. Romans 8.31. <clears throat> what shall we say then? That was a lot of theology, right? So what do we say about all these things? We're getting to our theme verse finally. So what shall we say to these things? And he's saying, what shall we say? Right? He's trying to have a conversation with us. So what do you want to do about it? What shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He's saying, join me here in this discussion because I'm going to ask you some questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God has called you, then he's justified you. And if he's justified you, then he's glorified you. This is the confidence we have in a sovereign God. Verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So who can be against us today? You might be a missionary and you might get your you might get tortured. You might become a victim of some violent crime. But who can be against us? Because you've been called. When you've been called, you've been justified. You've been justified, you've been glorified. Your eternity is secure. That's the sovereignty of God. That's the power of God. Then what does he ask next? In verse 33. <clears throat> Who shall bring up any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Who is to condemn? Remember the first verse of Romans chapter 1? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So nothing can be against us. There's nothing to condemn us. Because it's God who justifies. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God. Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, Christ's glory, sitting at the right hand of the God. The most powerful position in the cosmos, sitting at the right hand of God. Who is indeed interceding for Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's a quote from Psalms 44. People were being killed for serving Yahweh. So who can separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness. This is an anti-prosperity gospel. This is going to happen to people. It may not happen to everyone, but it will be, happen to people. Verse 37. <clears throat> No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I always wondered what was more than conquerors. I was reading about it. What's more than conquerors? Y'all have any ideas? You're more than a conqueror. You're a conqueror when you conquer people, right? But you're more than a conqueror when... You've not only conquered, but they become your servants. When they become your slaves. When they become your agents. And so look what's about to happen. No, in all these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger of the sword, look what's about to happen to all those things. In all these things, you're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, another thing he's confident in, he's not saying, I'm not, I don't know, I am sure that neither death, and he's going to list ten things here, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul uh, says in Philippians 1.20, to die is gain. That's not a loss. In 2 Corinthians, um, Paul's given a thorn in the flesh, and what does he say? With the thorn in the flesh. He's been given a messenger of Satan. Why? To keep him from being conceited. And what does he say? His grace is sufficient for me. In my weakness, he will be strong. More than a conqueror. Death is a tool. Death is no longer something we have to fear. It actually is something that helps us to be more conformed to like Jesus. When we go through persecution, when we go through tribulation, we go through difficult times in school with our family. We're going to go through difficult times in our lives. But who can separate you from the love of God? So as we live our life, the short life that we live, let's spend it for his glory. Let's spend it knowing that our eternal our eternity is secure. Nothing can stand against the love of God. And so as we close, as we see the book of Romans, chapter 8, I believe the most amazing chapter in the Bible. It's so full of the gospel and the strength of God. We see that God is sovereign and you are here for a reason. Nothing is random in this life. You know the earth rotating at a thousand miles an hour? We're a drop of water in the cosmos. It's a water, it's a, it's a drop of water rotating a thousand miles an hour with a little rock in the center. And we're going around the sun 66 at the speed 66,000 miles. Random. That's what you're going to learn in school. Chance. There is no chance. God, there's not one molecule that comes to you. There's no good luck. Everything happens under the ordination of God. He is sovereign. Good things and bad things. We have to reorient ourselves about what is good. We have to know that no matter what comes in our life, one thing remains. God is sovereign. You being here today, God called you. God calls justified. He justifies, he glorifies. That's the glory of God. That's the power of God. There is nothing greater. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we get to study through the book of Romans. We pray, O oh Lord, that in my weakness, O oh God, that you be strong, that we see better how strong you are, that we see better and more clearly that there is nothing greater than you, that we reorient ourselves to be more like your Son, and that we don't seek the things of the flesh but of the Spirit, Help us to be more than conquerors in this life, O oh God. Help us to use the troubling things in this life to serve us for your glory. We thank you so much. And we pray these things for your glory and our joy. In your name we pray.